Quiet, please. Quiet, please. Sergeant at Arms, can you please help administer removing these people from the floor, please? Thank you. Candy. Quiet, please. Quiet on the floor, please. Quiet on the floor, please. At this time, please place all electronic devices, all electronic devices to vibrate. Will all non-council employees, that means if you do not have a council identification, you must leave the main floor of the chambers. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Be safe. Please close the doors. Members, please have seats. Everyone, all the visitors, please have a seat. In the chambers as well, in the rotunda. Thank you. Please have a seat. Thank you all. May we close those doors in the back? Thank you. The recess meeting of June 15th held on June 21st, 2017 is now called to order. Roll call. Quiet in the chambers, please. Barron. Present. Borelli. Cabrera. Chin. Here. Cohen. Here. Constantinides. Cornegie. Shh. Crowley. Please quiet down. Cumbo. Present. Deutsch. Here. Drum. Here. Espinal. Here. Eugene. Present. Ferreris Copeland. Gorodnik. Gentili. Here. Gibson. Greenfield. Grudenchik. Here. Johnson. Here. Kalos. Here. King. Ku. Kozlowitz. Here. Lantzman. Here. Lander. Here. Levin. Here. Levine. Mizell. Here. Mealy. Menchaca. Presente. Mendez. Here. Miller. Present. Palma. Here. Perkins. Presente. Ku. Present. Reynoso. Present. Richards. Present. Rodriguez. Here. Rose. Here. Rosenthal. Here. Salamanca. Present. Torres. Traeger. Here. Ulrich. Vaca. Here. Ballone. Here. Williams. Here. Wills. Here. Matteo. Van Bramer. Speaker Mark Viverito. Here. I adjourn the recess meeting of June 15th and now call the stated meeting of June 21st to order. All rise, please, for the Pledge of Allegiance. All rise. Roll call. Barron. Present. Borelli. Cabrera. Chin. Here. Cohen. Constantinides. Here. Cornegie. Here. Crowley. Here. Cumbo. Here. Deutsch. Here. Drum. 
Espinal. Thank you. Eugene. Here. Ferreris Copeland. Garodnik. Here. Gentili. Gibson. Greenfield. Gradenchik. Here. Johnson. Here. Kalos. King. Ku. Present. Kozlowitz. Here. Lanceman. Here. Lander. Here. Levin. Here. Levine. Mizell. Here. Mealy. Menchaca. Presente. Mendez. Here. Miller. Present. Palma. Here. Perkins. Here. Reynoso. Here. Richards. Present. Rodriguez. Rose. Here. Rosenthal. Here. Salamanca. Present. Torres. Traeger. Here. Ulrich. Vaca. Here. Rodriguez. Ballone. Here. Williams. Here. Wills. Here. Matteo. Here. Van Bramer. Here. Speaker Mark Viverito. Kalos. Thank you. We do have some seats in the balcony. Please find a seat if appropriate. Please find a seat. I see some seats in the middle. The gentleman, if you would remove your hat, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. There's seats right in the middle, second row. All rise for the invocation. The invocation will be delivered by Reverend Ami Simpier, the editor at large of the New York nonprofit media, the Potter's House Church of the Living God, 148A Lewis Avenue in Bedford Stuyvesant, in the great borough of Brooklyn. Let us pray. Sweet Jesus, my savior and giver of life, I thank you for the opportunity to invite your holy presence into this gathering of decision makers in one of the greatest cities in the world. I thank you that the respect and need for prayer in all of its forms is recognized by this body because it speaks to an acknowledgement that intellect and material resources and even negotiation skills alone are not enough to best handle the task that is before them. It also takes the presence of the divine. God, in the beauty of the Statue of Liberty and the grace of the cloisters, you remind us that when humans of clay are inspired by their creator, the simplest elements can be melded to make miracles. Today, God, we present to you the simple elements of our hearts and minds, and we ask for miracles. At a time when our values of respect and compassion and unity are being tried and stretched nearly to their limits, I pray that these gathered here today would, through their decisions, co-create with you the kinds of miracles that remind us that all things are possible when we believe. Help us to honor the fact that each one of us here is a miracle, a melding of the persistent dreams and hopes of immigrants and refugees, craftsmen and merchants, young soldiers and slaves. We are all simple elements of clay touched by the love of God. Breathe on us now, clear our minds, embolden our hearts, focus our attention on what matters most at this moment, the choices being made and the lives affected. Lives like mine, born a black girl raised in vibrant East Harlem, raised by a single mom in a rent-stabilized tenement above a nonprofit whose music classes kept me off the streets and who grew up to be a Columbia University educated journalist. God, for everyone in this room, and all those who came before and made decisions that make life easier for me, thank you. For the city that accepted and permits me to marry my wife and partner of 22 years, who I am blessed to minister with as Christians championing the unconditional love of Christ within the LGBT community, thank you. For the legislation that provides a quality preschool education for our five-year-old, and for the health system that is already helping to care for her sibling that I carry, thank you. 
and for the neighborhoods, communities, and loved ones that have taught all of us here how to take care of each other and work together, thank you. And lastly, we thank you for the miracle of your presence that will help these gathered here with open hearts and minds to honor the lives of the some eight million miracles in this city, all your sons and your daughters, whether wealthy or homeless, elderly or newborn, citizen or undocumented, straight, gay, transgender, Muslim or Jew. Thank you. Into your hands, we commit these proceedings. I ask these things in the name of the lover of my soul, Jesus, the Christ of God. And may all those who are committed to the work of strengthening and uniting this great city and its people say amen. 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 Please be seated. Yes. Shh. Quiet in the chambers. A motion to spread that powerful invocation. Council member Robert Cornegie representing Bedford-Stuyvesant in North Crown Heights. Yes, ma'am. Reverend Ame St. Pierre serves as the Potter's House, serves as the serves at the Potter's House Church of the Living God, one of the longest running independent LGBT founded non-denominal churches in Brooklyn. Reverend St. Pierre was born in Lenox Hill Hospital, raised in East Harlem, and started her faith career as the assistant chaplain of the Cathedral Choir of Greater Refuge Temple Church of Our Lord Jesus Christ in Harlem, New York City. After attending LaGuardia High School of Music and Art as a flute major and Barnard College as a political science major and receiving a master's degree from Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism, Reverend St. Pierre began ministering as choir director and praise and worship leader at the Potter's House Church of the Living God, where she was ordained and currently stands in for the pastor and founder, Bishop Barbara Caesar Stevenson, in her health-related absence. Reverend St. Pierre spent nearly a decade working on the national desk of the Associated Press and served as Director of Development and Communications for Jacob A. Reese Neighborhood Settlement in Long Island City, Queens. She's the great-granddaughter of Maud Bascom Cummings-Taylor, who served as organist for Bedford Stuyvesant's Cornerstone Baptist Church, which happens to be my church, for over 40 years. And she lives in the Bed-Stuy Brownstone, out of which her great-grandmother started a community music school in the mid-1900s. Her grandfather is a reverend and graduate of Un Union Theological Seminary, who serves among the clergy at Harlem's Riverside Church and started a nonprofit called Harlem Interfaith Counseling Service. Reverend St. Pierre is currently the editor at large for the New York nonprofit media, which is owned by city and state. She also serves on the board of Manor House Workshops, founded by Gloria Denard, which is the longest running cultural arts organization in East Harlem. Reverend St. Pierre lives in Brooklyn with her wife Miriam, daughter Savannah, and Tina, their turtle. Big shout out to Bed Stuy Brooklyn, of course. Amen. Quiet in the chambers. Adoption of minutes. Adoption of minutes, Council Member Espinal. No one told me I was adopting the minutes. How do you say it? I move to adopt the minutes. So, <laughs> so moved. Messages and papers from the mayor. <laughs> M521, submitting Thomas Sorrentino for appointment to the Taxi and Limousine Commission. Rules, privileges, and elections. Communication from city, county, and borough offices. None. Petitions and communications. None. Land use call-ups. M522 and 523. Coupled on call-up vote, ask for roll call on all call-up votes. Quiet in the chambers for a roll call. Byron. Vote aye. Borelli. Cabrera. Chin. Aye. Cohen. Uh, I would like to vote aye on all call-ups, and with permission, I would like to vote uh, on all coupled items on the general order calendar and all resolutions. Yes. I vote aye on all. Thank you. Can we, Councilmember Barron? Did, no, okay, sorry. Constantinidis? Aye. Carnegie? Councilmember Carnegie? Aye. Crowley? Madam Public Advocate, can I have permission to vote on all land use call ups and all calendar items? Yes. I vote aye. Thank you. Combo? I vote aye. Deutsch. I'd like to ask a very moving permission to vote on all call-ups and land use items. Yes. Thank you. Drum. How do you vote, council member? Deutsch. Aye. Thank you. Drum. Aye. 
Espinel. Aye. Eugene. I vote aye. Ferreras Copeland. Garodnik. Aye. Gentili. I would ask permission to uh, vote on all general orders. I vote yes on all land use call ups and ask permission to vote on general orders and resolutions. Yes. Um, with congratulations to Rosie Mendez on intro 1233A, I vote aye and all. Thank you. Gibson. Sorry, pass. Just, okay. Greenfield. Thank you. I vote aye on the call ups, but also request permission to vote on the general order calendar on all coupled items, including resolutions. Yes. I vote aye. Thank you. Grodenschik. I vote aye on all call ups and the general calendar, and I ask permission to vote aye on all. Yes. The first time I'm doing this, I'm a little nervous. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Public. Thank Advocate. you. Johnson. I vote aye. Thank you. Kalos. Aye. Thank you. King. Coup. Uh, Madam Public Advocate, may I have permission to vote on all general order and then use co ops? Yes, sir. Yeah, I vote aye on all. Thank you. Koslowitz. Aye. Thank you. Lanceman. I would like to vote aye on all call ups, and with permission, I'd like to vote on all coupled items on the general order calendar and all resolutions. Yes. I vote aye. Thank you. Shh. Lander. Thank you. I said yes. Levin. 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 Levine. Levine. My Mizell, Mealy, Menchaca. Permission to vote on general uh, orders and land use call ups. Yes. Uh, I vote aye on all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Mendez. Aye on all. Thank you. Miller. Vote aye. Thank you. Palma. I vote aye on all land use call ups, and with permission, I would like to vote on all general items on today's calendar and resolutions. Yes, I vote aye. Thank you. Perkins. Aye on all. Thank you. Reynoso. Uh, Madam Public Advocate, uh, permission to vote on general orders and all land use call, uh, call ups? Yes. I vote aye on all. Thank you. Richards. Aye. Rodriguez. Rose. Aye. Rosenthal. Aye. Salamanca. Uh, Madam Public Advocate, I would like to vote aye on all call ups, and with permission, I would like to vote on all call up items on the general order calendar and all resolutions. Yes. I vote aye. Thank you. Thank you. Torres. Aye. Thank you. Traeger. Uh, with permission, uh, Public Advocate, I would like to vote on all call ups and general order items. Yes. I vote aye. Thank you. Thank you. Levin. Aye. Thank you. Ulrich. Councilmember Ulrich. Aye. Bless you. Vaca. I vote aye on all land use call ups and I ask permission to vote on all general uh, order calendar yes. items. I yes. vote aye on all except 1541. I vote no. Thank you. Valoon. Permission to vote aye on all matters on today's calendar, including co ops? Yes. I vote aye. Thank you. Williams. Aye. Thank you. Wills. Uh, Madam Public Advocate Letitia Tish James from Brooklyn, I would like permission to vote on all land use call ups and a couple items on the general order calendar. Thank you, Councilmember Wills from St. Queens, Southeast Queens in particular. <laughs> yes. Uh, with thoughtful concession for an amendment for the extension of effective date on uh, intro 1233, I vote aye on all. Thank you. Thank you. Gibson. I vote aye. Thank you. Matteo. Van Bramer. 
With permission, I would like to vote aye on all land use call-ups and general orders. Yes. I vote aye. Thank you. Speaker Mark Viverino. All of those members who have voted, could you please remain in your seat until we do a vote? We need to make sure that we have maintained quorum. Please do not leave the chambers. I apologize. The land use call-up vote is 44, oh, here we go. Today's land use call-ups are vote, adopted by a vote of 44 in the affirmative and zero in the negative. Quiet in the chambers as we now hear from the speaker, Melissa Mark Viverito. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate, and good afternoon to everyone. Happy first day of summer. Have, uh, happy early 4th of July. Um, we do have a long agenda today, so I'm going to not speak too much on the bills, allow the council colleagues that are sponsoring the bills to speak on them. Uh, it, but first of all, before we begin, I want to take a moment to welcome Dr. Lawrence Joseph to the chambers. Dr. Joseph is the uncle of council member Jermani Williams. He's here. Uh, and the former attorney general, former house speaker, former Senate president, and current deputy governor general of the nation of Grenada. So welcome, speaker to speaker. <laughs> uh, he is also a Knight Commander of the Order of the British Empire, granted to him in 2015 in recognition of his significant contributions to the Grenadian community. We are honored to have you here, Dr. Joseph. Thank you, uh, welcome you to City Hall. And I'm sure uh, you can, with Germani's mom, be very proud as you oversee what your nephew is doing today and his service to the city. Uh, so today the council is going to begin by voting on the rezoning of Broad Channel and Hamilton Beach in order to combat the anticipated effects of sea level rise. Uh, on the legislative side, our first vote will deal with expanding an exemption to the commercial building air conditioner law. Uh, this is introduction 1503B, sponsored by Enver Enver Environmental Protection Committee Chair Costa Constantinidis, who will speak about the bill. On staff, I want to thank Samara Swanston, Bill Murray, John Seltzer, Jen Wilcox, and Ed Atkin. And with that, Councilmember Constantinidis, if you could say a few words. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, two years ago, we passed Local Law 92 of 2015, which strengthened the requirement of the landmark air conditioning law in 2008. That bill required that all retail establishments, regardless of size, shut the front Excuse door. Excuse me, council member. May we have quiet in the chambers, please, out of respect for the council member. Thank you. I apologize. Nope. And, and, and not let air conditioning blow out onto the sidewalk. As tempting as it may be on hot days like this, uh, the increased fossil fuel burden and cost energy grid far outweigh the benefits of luring one or two uh, additional customers into a store. At that time, though, we included several exemptions, including for restaurants with sidewalk cafes or where a sidewalk cafe isn't allowed, restaurants with French doors and windows. This amendment, 1503B, simply clarifies that the latter part of these restaurants were never intended to be captured by the air conditioner law. For these restaurants, where the draw of an open door window is the essential part of their business, the thing that the part and parcel of who they are and keeps their doors open, literally, uh, we want to ensure that they are treated no differently than a restaurant a block or two away that's able to get a sidewalk cafe license. This will not weaken our environmental impact of our air conditioning law. We've conducted an environmental review and found it to have no detrimental impact on our commitment to reducing carbon 80 percent by 2050. All this does is protect our small businesses and restaurants in our neighborhoods that need to keep the doors open in order to keep the doors open. So uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, again, and thank all of my council colleagues for uh, considering this bill. And I want to thank Samara Swanson, Bill Murray, Ed Atkin, and Nick Wazowski and my staff. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Next, the Council will vote on Introduction 1347A, sponsored by Council Member Robert Cornegie. This has to do with the DOE and distribution of information regarding gifted and talented programs. And I want to thank Matt Carlin, Smita Deshmukh, Aisha Schomburg, and Tirza Nasser for their work on this. And Council Member Cornegie will speak to the bill.
Madam, Madam Speaker, I'm trying to gather my notes. Can, oh, sure, can come, come back. back. No worries, no worries, come back. Thank you. Um, Next on the agenda, traveling circuses subject performing animals to extensive travel, which limits their movement and restricts natural behaviors. Introduction 1233A is sponsored by Council Member Rosie Mendez. Uh, she's been working on this bill for a long time. I'm glad that we're seeing it being voted on today. It prohibits the use of certain wild and exotic animals in circuses, including elephants, big cats, giraffes, apes, and bears. Uh, just to know that we are voting on this bill today. We're also going to vote on a bill at a later time in July to extend the compliance period to allow circuses additional time to adjust their business model. And with that, I'd like to ask Council Member Mendez to say a few words. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I am pleased to introduce and get this uh, intro 1233 voted on today. I want to thank all of my colleagues and I want to thank uh, my five staff members through the 11 years who have worked on this bill. Lisa Kaplan, Janos Martin, Christopher Labarge, Jasmine Torres, and John Blasco, who's currently working with me, who helped me get this over the finish line. I want to thank John Phillips, my friend, my constituent, um, who has worked on this bill with me prior to me getting into the council and has trusted me to uh, shepherd this bill through the council. I want to thank Christina Syringe from Animals uh, Defenders International, who worked with me and my staff during the past few years on some of the language. David Seitzer from the Housing Committee. Ramon, I will thank you too. Thank you for everything. Um, Councilmember Johnson, for your assistance and being the co-sponsor on this bill. It's taken a long time. We've made a lot of changes to the bill. So I want to thank the people who've supported it and the people who were opposed, because through that process, I think we've made this a better bill. Um, I will also be introducing um, a pre-considered intro uh, with other members that will change the implementation date of when this bill becomes effective. I think that it is correct to allow current businesses to adjust their business model in light of this legislation being passed. And I want to thank all my colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member. And coming from the Committee on Land Use, Introduction 1219A, sponsored by Committee Chair David Greenfield, regarding uh, privately owned public spaces. I'll leave it at that. He can speak to the bill uh, and uh, all the details regarding it. Council Member Greenfield. Thank you, Speaker. There are 3.2 million square feet of public space in New York City that are known as POPs. These privately owned public spaces are at 500 different, 500 different sites in 300 different locations across the city. And so the obvious question is, where do they come from? And the answer is that developers made a deal with the city that in return for the ability to build more private, commercial, and residential floor area, they would give something back to the city, which is private space. Unfortunately, most developers have not been keeping that deal. In the hearing that we had, as well as a follow-up audit by the controller's office, the majority of these POPs were not allowing people in or were violating the public space that they had agreed to give in some other way. Our bill today is going to solve this problem in three distinct but important ways. The first is that the bill will now require for the city to have a database on where exactly these POPs are and what exactly you can do in these public spaces. In fact, right now, we don't even know where all these public spaces are and so we can't even utilize them. The second thing this bill does is require signage at those public spaces to be clear as to what you can and cannot do at that public space and what times you can use the space and what sort of amenities are provided in the space as well. And the third and most important part of the bill will require regular inspection of these public spaces to make sure that the developers are keeping the deal that they made with the city. To give you an example of just how egregious this is, there is actually a publicly owned private space located at 410 East 58th Street that actually disappeared when the building owner built a hotel lobby on top of a space that was meant for the public. That's just insane. 
And so the law that we are passing today will make sure that the public will be able to reclaim literally 80 acres of public space. I would like to thank my outstanding land use staff for their really wonderful work, especially Raju Mann and Amy Leviton and Julie Lubin, Jeff Capagna, who spent hours working on this and stayed the other night until midnight, including my own outstanding chief of staff, Danny Perlstein, and my terrific counsel, Elena Secheva, who spent dozens of hours on this bill as well. And of course, I want to thank the speaker, and I want to thank Councilmember Ben Kalos for partnering with me on this and a future bills that we're going to be working on as well. And finally, I want to thank Professor Gerald Caden, who literally wrote the book on POPs. He came down, he testified, and he helped us develop this bill. And for the first time, once this bill passes, we will now know where the public space is, we will have access to that public space, and we will have enforcement to make sure that all New Yorkers can use millions of square feet in public space that were promised, but unfortunately, those promises weren't kept. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Council Member. Introduction 1304B and 1649 are sponsored by our Minority Leader, Steve Matteo, and has to do with the Alternative Exemption for Veterans, a, which is a real property tax exemption. Uh, there are some adjustments. We're going to be providing greater relief to veterans. I want to thank Matteo for his leadership and for this Council for really advocating strongly for this to happen. Staff, I want to thank Latanya McKinney, Ray Majeski, Emery M Emra Edev, Eric Bernstein, Maria Enache, and Rebecca Chasen, and Councilmember Medio. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, today's a great day for veterans in New York City. Uh, it wasn't easy to get here. It took a lot of negotiation, some compromise to make this day a reality. And for that, I want to thank the Speaker and my colleagues uh, for working with me on this veterans' property tax exemption. A lot of people talk about the debt we owe our veterans, but today the New York City Council is doing much more than paying lip service to that debt. The alternative property tax exemption for veterans we are voting makes it possible for us to provide veterans with further savings on their property taxes. It allows New York City to exempt them from most or all of the school portion of the property tax, as many other municipalities in the state already do. As part of our budget agreement with the administration, we are capping the exemption to control the cost of the city and give us some fiscal certainty in the years to come. But most importantly, this new exemption will save the average veteran household more than $500 more on their property tax bill each year for a total average savings of more than $1,100 when combined with the existing exemption. This is going to have a real impact on the lives of tens of thousands of veterans and their families, most of whom are seniors, at or near retirement, and living on a fixed income. Nearly 70% have served during a time of war, and the majority are also homeowners. This money will be a lifeline for them and help them remain a vital part of our communities. I believe, as many others do, that we need to provide more property tax relief to more families to help them remain in the city, and we need a more fair and equitable property tax system. But until we can pass real property tax reform, we must pass legislation of the measures like this. I cannot think of a better place to start than with a bill that helps those New Yorkers who served and sacrificed to preserve our freedoms and our great democracy. Uh, I also want to thank the Council Finance staff, uh, led by Latonia McKinney. Uh, I also want to uh, thank uh, Ray Majeski, Emery Edev, and Eric Bernstein for helping pull this uh, bill over the finish line. I want to thank my staff, particularly David Carr and Peter Spencer. I want to thank my colleagues uh, with the Speaker, my Staten Island Council delegation, um, and Jimmy Vaca for his strong support. And finally, I want to thank Finance Chair Jalissa Ferreras Copeland for her early support, leadership, and partnership. Um, again, uh, it's a great day for veterans, and I urge my colleagues to vote yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, additionally, continuing our work to make New York a more accessible city for our nation's servicemen and women, Intro 1259A, sponsored by Councilmember Germani Williams, would prohibit discriminating on the basis of uniform service and provide local recourse for veterans who have been victims of discrimination. Uh, on the staff side, I want to thank Eric Bernstein, Z. Emanuel Heilu, and Rachel Cordero. Councilmember Williams will speak to the bill. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. When I realized that I was going to be in uh, support with Councilmember Matteo and Ulrich, I almost changed my mind, but I, and uh, especially Borelli. I almost changed my mind, but I decided to keep going with it anyway. Um, I want to thank uh, the Speaker for her leadership and uh, Councilmember Milley, who chaired the committee this came out of and the public advocate, who is a co-prime sponsor with the administration of Intro 1259. This bill will give veterans and active military members direct protections under city law against discrimination in housing, employment, and public accommodations. I believe people would be shocked to learn how many veterans are discriminated against in those areas 
people who are concerned that they will be called up to duty, others who, will be, who are of the false uh, preconception that everyone suffers from PTSD. Uh, we have a tendency to prop veterans and uniform services uh, members up when it suits us, but we don't fulfill uh, the other end of the bargain, which was the protections they were promised when they agreed to risk their life for the country. New York State is home to nearly 900,000 veterans, 225,000 of whom uh, call New York City home. According to the U.S. Department of Labor, nearly 14,000 veterans are unemployed across New York State. And, and uh, there's a huge issue, as I mentioned, this is, I want to make it clear, I don't support many of the wars uh, that this country has uh, gone to, uh, but I do support the human beings uh, that were sent to those wars and the promises that were made, including many of my uh, friends and family, uh, my cousin who was injured when the building blew up uh, as his team was searching uh, for bombs, and my little brother in a few months who will be uh, joining the U.S. Navy. Uh, so with that, I'm proud of this uh, bill to provide the protections to them. Again, I thank all of the staff that the speaker mentioned, my staff, the administration, public advocate, Commissioner Laurie Sutton, Brigadier General in the retired U.S. Army, and Veterans Alliance, Christine Rouse. Thank you, Councilmember. And, and you just said you didn't think you'd find yourself on the same side on an issue with Councilmember Mario. Well, listen, I just found out that Eric Ulrich is half Puerto Rican. Who would have thought? <laughs> you know, what, what, are we, what are we coming to? <laughs> he shared his ancestry DNA lineage there, and wow. I'm going to join wow. the BLAC now. I'm just letting you all know. <laughs> I have a DNA test to prove it. I don't want to hear a peep, all right? Si se puede. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, <laughs> but it's true. I wasn't joking about it. He did. He is a Puerto Rican. Um, as, we <laughs> as we continue <laughs> following up on initiatives like our successful summer youth employment program, I'm happy to note that the council will be voting on Introduction 709A, sponsored by Youth Services Committee Chair Matthew Eugene, which would establish a disconnected youth workforce development program for youth aged 18 to 24 and run through the Department of Small Business Services. Um, I want to thank Councilmember Eugene, and he will speak to the bill. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, I'm uh, very excited that today we will pass Introduction 709A, this bill is a, a continuation of our effort to improve the quality of services available to the disconnected youth in our city and our quest to end the disconnected youth crisis in New York. Many advocates for disconnected youth highlighted that the Department of Small Businesses, SBS, Disconnected Youth Program was not comprehensive enough to meet the demands and disconnect of disconnected youth SBS provides job placement services through its uh, Workforce One career centers, which are designed to serve adults and are better suited to serve adults who have been in the workforce but does not provide specialized services for young people. This legislation requires SBS to provide services such as referring disconnected youth to agencies a community-based organization that will help them deal with issues such as mental health, child care, criminal justice issues, and transportation. Additionally, the legislation requires SBS to develop and implement education and job training program, including entrepreneurial skill training to provide follow-up services and financial literacy education. It is important to note that DYCD, the Department of Education, the Human Services Administration, and the Mayor Office will be involved in this implementation of the program. I am truly delighted that this bill ensures that SBS Disconnected Youth Program will provide targeted services that promise to equip our disconnected youth with an education and work skill better suited to, to meet uh, the challenges of the 21st century because them too deserve the opportunity to succeed. We want to encourage our young men and women who have struggled to make a transition into workforce to attend job training, financial literacy, 
and entrepreneurial skill. This bill aims to give young people new opportunities that will promote a sense of accomplishment and responsibility. In the great city of New York, there is no reason why our talented young people should not be able to, to secure better futures for themselves and their families. I believe that Intro 709 is an integral part of improving how we work with disconnected youth. I want to, to thank the speaker for our leadership, and I want to thank also the community staff led by our council, Kiwu Gushiru, the policy analyst, Michael Benjamin, senior financial analyst, Jessica Ackerman, and also my legislative and budget director, Ethan Tucker. And thank you to all of you, each one of you, for what you are doing every single day for our young people in New York City. Thank you very much, Madam uh, Speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. And now, Council is going to be voting on two sets of legislation today aimed at addressing the health needs of some of New York City's most vulnerable communities. Intro 1225A is sponsored by Council Member uh, Richie Torres, which would mandate that the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, in consultation with the Office of the Mayor and other agencies, create and submit to the mayor and the city council a plan to serve the behavioral health needs of LGBTQ persons, including young people under 24 and elders over 65. Staff, I want to thank Teresa Nasser, Aisha Schomburg, Nicole Abin, and Jeanette Merrill. Council member, you want to speak on the issue? Yes, thank yes. you, Madam Speaker. Th this legislation would create would require the city to create the first ever comprehensive mental health plan for the LGBT community with a particular focus on LGBT youth and LGBT seniors who face some of the highest rates of isolation, depression, and tragically suicide. Uh, the trauma of eviction from one's home at the hands of one's own parents, uh, estrangement from one's family, ostracism from one's culture and society, these traumas remain epidemic in, in the LGBT community and the city should be better equipped to address the complex needs of some of our most vulnerable populations. And so a plan for the mental health needs of the LGBT community at its core is a plan to save lives. And a huge debt of gratitude to you, Madam Speaker, to Council Member Cohen, the chair of the Mental Health Committee, to the LGBT caucus, and to everyone who had a role in crafting the legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, I think Robert Cornegy, Council Member Cornegy is ready to speak on his bill uh, regarding uh, gifted and talented programs. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you for your indulgence. Uh, so in 2014, Mayor de Blasio charted a very aggressive course to ensure educational opportunity was universally accessible to all New York City's children, regardless of the neighborhood in which they lived. At the beginning of 2014, there were 20,000 free full-day pre-K seats available to four-year-old New Yorkers. Today, there are 70,000 with plans to expand universal access to pre-kindergarten to three-year-olds as well. Intro 1347 marks another significant step forward in providing young New Yorkers equal access to educational opportunities that will play a vital role in shaping their futures. For too long, gifted and talented programs were unavailable in school districts serving primarily minority communities. Worse, information regarding how parents in these communities could opt into an advanced level of education for their children was incredibly hard to obtain. After intro 1347 becomes law, the parents of children enrolled in the city's universal pre-K program will be provided with information regarding the DOE gifted and talented program exam and application process so that all of New York City's children have access to advanced level of education. I'd like to thank Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito, Chair of the Education Committee, Council Member Danny Drum, and the members of the Education Committee, Asia Schomburg, Tears of Nazar, Rob Newman, Jan Atwell, Joan, Polvoni, my staff, and the many other council members who signed on to this, to sponsor this important piece of legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, introduction 929A is sponsored by Health Committee Chair Corey Johnson, uh, requiring DHS to uh, on, do some online reporting, and also on introduction 932A, which is General Welfare uh, Committee Chair Steve Levin, which will require DHS to provide um, uh, some information on site, on its website, annual report regarding mental health services provided to individuals in the shelter system. I want to thank Andrea Vasquez, Tanya Cyrus, Aisha Schomburg, and Teresa Nasser. I'll start off with Councilmember Johnson, and then if uh, Councilmember Levin can speak to his bill. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Homelessness, as everyone knows, is one of the most pressing and heartbreaking issues that we as a city deal with nearly every single day. 
the crisis that we're facing with over 60,000 people sleeping in our shelter system, 24,000 of whom are children, requires us to address both the short-term problems we face on a daily basis and the larger systemic issues behind them. This legislation is fairly simple. It arises from the startling lack of data regarding the health needs of our city's homeless population and the lack of data around the services available to them. It's impossible to address health issues facing our most vulnerable citizens if we don't know what those issues are and the current efforts we're undertaking to address them. If we're going to do right by the homeless population in New York City and address health issues facing homeless New Yorkers, we need a better understanding of services currently available, which shelters they're available in, and where there may be gaps. We have a responsibility to safeguard the health and safety of our most vulnerable citizens. That is a promise our city has made to New Yorkers, and it's a promise we must keep. This legislation will be an important step in this endeavor. I'd like to thank my very good friend and the chair of the General Welfare Committee, Steve Levin, for his leadership and partnership on this issue and on everything related to homelessness in New York City. Uh, this is a package of bills that he and I have worked on together. We had a great hearing on these bills, and I really want to thank him. I also want to thank uh, David Seitzer, Crystal Pond, and my Deputy Chief of Staff, um, Louis Cholden Brown. I ask my colleagues to vote in favor of this legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I would like to uh, also ask my colleagues to support Intro 932A. Uh, I also want to thank uh, my colleague Corey Johnson on his partnership on these pieces of legislation to ensure that those people that are most vulnerable in New York City, those that are living in the shelter system, have adequate health and mental health services. Uh, intro 932A uh, is, uh, is going to require that the Department of Homeless Services uh, provide information on the number of DHS, shelter, DHS shelters, HASA facilities, and domestic violence shelters with on-site mental health services, and a description of those services, description of the mental health services at each intake center, description of mental health services provided at drop-in centers and safe havens, a description of the mental health services provided to the unsheltered homeless population direct, directly and by referral, and including the number of removals initiated pursuant to Section 9. 58 of the mental hygiene law, a list of the, most ten, the 10 most commonly occurring mental health issues for adults living in shelter, and the 10 most commonly occurring health problems for children living in shelter as self-reported at intake, a list of the 10 most common mental health issues for adults living in shelter, and the 10 most common mental health issues for children living in shelter as reported by providers under contract or similar agreements with department to provide mental health services. Uh, as well as any metrics relevant to the provision of mental health services reported directly to the department by any entity providing those services. This is a comprehensive piece of legislation um, that will really speak to the, the uh, great need in our city uh, to provide mental health services for especially children but families as well uh, who are going through the intense trauma of homelessness and through the shelter system. I want to thank the speaker for her support. Again, I want to thank uh, my colleague Corey Johnson uh, for working with me on this legislation, as well as uh, committee staff Andrea Vasquez, uh, committee counsel Tanya Cyrus, senior policy analyst, the Stacey Award, uh, our uh, legal fellow, as well as my uh, chief of staff Jonathan Boucher and former uh, deputy, uh, former uh, legislative director Julie Barrow for working on this legislation. And with that, I urge my colleagues to vote aye. Thank you. Um, give me one second. All right, our final legislative package deals with reforms to the Department of Correction bail posting process, an initiative that was originally announced in my February State of the City address. This package looks to prevent individuals from being sent to Rikers erroneously or due to bureaucratic inefficiencies. By simplifying the bail posting process, we are aiming to reduce the number of people who end up entrenched in the system in the first place, a goal that will serve us well as we organize to close Rikers in the next 10 years. Currently, those who wish to post bail on behalf of those in the custody of the Department of Correction face numerous obstacles in doing so. These can include blackout periods in which the DOC will not accept bail, individuals in custody being transferred to Rikers Island without the notice required to post bail in a timely manner, and antiquated systems that may delay an individual's release after the posting of bail. This package of five bills seeks to improve and reform this system. I want to thank Brian Crow and Will Hongetch. I hope I pronounced it right. Introduction 1531A which I sponsor would address these issues by requiring the DOC to immediately and continuously accept bail 
release incarcerated individuals for whom bail is posted within five hours in most circumstances and within three hours by October of 2018 and accept bail for individuals in DOC custody, either online, in courthouses, or in locations within half a mile of a courthouse. Those on any side of the criminal justice system deserve exactly that, their due justice. This legislation seeks to add additional transparency to that process here in New York City by enabling those who have followed bail guidelines to avoid harmful and unnecessary additional time in incarceration. Introduction 1541A, sponsored by Public Safety Chair Vanessa Gibson, would permit the DOC to delay the transfer of the incarcerated from courthouse facilities to Rikers Island in order to facilitate posting. Council Member Gibson, if you'd like to speak to your bill. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, this bill really provides a lot of equity in the criminal justice system, from our overburdened jails to families that are impacted by a breadwinner having to spend the night on Rikers. Fixing our broken bail system will benefit everyone. Thanks to the common sense and reasonable approaches made through this legislative package today, we are promoting fairness in the justice system, as well as lowering the population of detainees in jail across our city. The bill I've introduced, 1541, will make an important and overdue correction to the Department of Corrections handling of detainees who have just had their bail set. This bill requires an individual who meets certain qualifications, such as being accused of a nonviolent offense and having bail less than $10,000, be kept at the courthouse for at least four hours and no more than 12 hours, giving their family and friends time to collect and post their bond. Automatically transferring individuals after bail is set makes no sense, it's costly, and it adds to the prison population. It requires a costly intake process as well as furthering individuals who are able to post bail do so within 24 to 48 hours. That's the typical time frame. This bill identifies those most likely to post bail, helps to speed up the process, saves the city money along the way, it cuts the red tape and improves efficiency at the DOC, and they need efficiency at the DOC. I want to thank our speaker for her continued advocacy and leadership for an improved and reformed bail system. I want to thank our chair of fire and criminal justice, Chair Elizabeth Crowley. I want to thank Brian Crow and Rob Newman and the entire team because intro 1541 will create a simple procedural change that will have a significant and broad impact and I urge all of my colleagues to vote yes on intro 1541. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Councilmember Gibson. Intro 1561A is sponsored by Fire and Criminal Justice Services Chair Elizabeth Crowley. Uh, it has to do with notification of bail options. I'm going to leave it up to her to explain the bill. And uh, Councilmember Crowley. Oh, she left. Okay. So it has to do with bail notification for individuals. And a written summary of their bail and options for paying the bail, including option to post bail for themselves. I want to thank her for her leadership on this bill. Uh, also then, the next one uh, is Introduction 1576, sponsored by Councilmember Rory Lansman. Uh, has to do with access to personal information, if Councilmember Lansman could speak to his bill. He left as well. All right, so uh, individuals arrested by the New York City Police Department are brought to criminal court within 24 hours to be arraigned before a judge. It's important that these individuals have contact information for their friends and families for a variety of reasons. Presently, the NYPD does not consistently permit arrestees to access their mobile phones or other sources of contact information. So that's what intro 1576A would do, uh, would permit such access unless the property is arrest evidence or is relevant criminal evidence. And last up is intro 1581A, sponsored by Council Member Antonio Reynoso, who I think is also has left, would require the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice to make reasonable efforts to work with the court system to ensure that complete and accurate information regarding posting bail is posted in courthouses or communicated directly through the use of bail kiosks that are currently operational in the Bronx criminal courts. And before concluding, I wanna take a moment to highlight the vote that will be happening today regarding resolution 1415A, which is sponsored by myself and council member Anabel Palma. Thank you, council member. Described in my February State of the City address, this resolution calls upon the New York State Education Department to convene a task force to assess the cultural relevance of state learning standards across subject areas in elementary, middle, and high school 
and to explore the grounding standards and core content that challenges racism, ableism, sexism, and is inclusive to LGBTQ and TGNC lifestyles. Our children deserve an education that reflects the lives and worlds they experience every day, and I'm proud to be sponsoring this resolution today with my colleague, Councilmember Palma. And with that, I end the communication from the speaker. Thank you so much. We thank those members who voted early and who remained for the purposes of maintaining quorum. Um, if you have to leave now, um, you may do so, and we thank you for that. Um, for general orders, discussions, beginning with Council Member King. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Madam Speaker and all. Um, I just want to address us um, as a council. I know we're responsible for passing legislation that improves the quality of life in the city of New York. However, I am troubled and dismayed at one piece of legislation that we'll be voting on today. As a child, I've had the privilege of being able to attend the circus where I got to see acts, uh, whether they were animals or humans who performed um, unique, with unique abilities. Um, I think that today we're getting ready to vote on a bill that may be somewhat uh, discriminatory because we have rules in place. If you violate those rules in the city of New York when you provide a circus, you cannot do this i.e. Ringling Brothers. So right now we have one circus that still exists and that is the Universal Soul Circus that still exists that's been performing across the United States for 25 years. And they have followed the rules, they have not broken any of the city rules. So I find a little bit bizarre that this day and age that we'll create a rule that will eliminate them from coming to the city of New York and deliver the services that they've been delivering. In a progressive council, we've always talked about being progressive. The Universal Soul Circus is the only black-owned, minority-owned circus in the United States of America, and we get ready to shut them out of New York City with intro Bill 1233. I don't think it's fair. I don't think it's right. And I really hope that we reconsider when we vote today to give our children the opportunity to enjoy the same experiences that we enjoyed as children when we went to the circuses. And remember, again, if we are ones that promote businesses, we know in communities of color where the Universal Soul goes, there are jobs that get created, there are entertainment that's duly noted, and it has an impact on the boroughs of the Bronx, Queens, and Brooklyn. So I ask us all to reconsider um, when we take our vote today to be real careful what we're getting ready to do because what will be next? They talk about mistreating animals in the circus. There's no proof that the Universal Soul Circus has ever done this. And then if we're talking about mistreatment of animals, we all have had to correct our own animals at home to discipline them. And if we're going to do that, do we get rid of our own pets? If adults, if adults, quiet, if, if adults have abuse, if adults Wide abuse our children, do Thank we get rid of all of our children? No, we don't. So if someone's following the rules, why do we create new rules to get rid of them? So I'm saying we should be really paying attention to what's going on right here and not play politics and do the right thing. And I vote, ask everyone not to vote for intro 1233. Thank you. Council Member Johnson. Uh, Madam Public Advocate, I'll wait for the roll call instead of speaking now. Sorry about that. Thank, Thank you. you. Council Member Drum. Thank you. I just want to make reference to the report from the council from the committee that uh, found that traveling circuses are detrimental to animal welfare due to the adverse effects of frequent transport, extended periods of confinement, and physically abusive training techniques. The extended period of time in vehicles and temporary facilities facilitated, util, uh, utilized by the circus industry, restrict natural behaviors and cause animals to suffer and be prone to health, behavior, and psychological problems. Tricks that exotic and wild animals are forced to perform require extreme physical coercion techniques, including the restriction of food, the use of bull hooks, and a heavy, which is a heavy bar with sharpened point and a hook, electrical shocks, metal bars, whips, and other forms of physical abuse. That's why today I urge my colleagues to vote in favor of this uh, legislation. Thank you. Thank you for those in the balcony. This is how we express ourselves. Thank you so much. For a vote, Council Member Lori Cumbo. Permission to vote on all general and coupled orders and resolutions? Yes. I vote aye. Thank you. Council Member Miller? Thank you, Madam Public Advocate. I also want to talk about intro 1233. While I'm sure that my colleagues who support this legislation do so with the best of intentions, but what I'd like to talk about are the unintended consequences. The under, uh, and in particular, I'd like to t talk about one great example, which is the Universal Soul Circus, which for nearly 25 years have served, which is an African-American-owned business and a traveling circus, which is for more than 25 years, for nearly 25 years, have served uh, community, not just communities of color, but communities throughout the city with circus performers from throughout the world. In particular, we have welcomed them in the Southeast Queens, in particular, Southern Queens Park, 
which is ran by the city, which depends on these resources that come in. They are the number one generator of revenue for the Southern Queens Park Association. The, the, the uh, partnership that, have, that we have is with not-for-profits, community-based organizations. In fact, this past April, we brought in nearly 3,000 families from New York City shelters, which enjoyed a full day at the circus, which enjoyed days with the performers, the animals. Uh, we fed them and, and everything. So while we should have learned from our experience with the horse carriage debate whether or not to consider these type of consequences, but to be able to get better to resolve these, and instead of simply imposing bans, we should be working on how to find solutions that will keep these men and women employed and keep these animals safe. Intro 1233 does not allow for any middle ground and takes advantage of small minority-owned businesses that is only looking to continue to contribute to communities and society as they have done in the past. I will be voting no and ask my, my colleagues to do the same. Thank you. Councilmember Rose. Um, Madam Public Advocate, um, I want to speak today um, concerning the property tax exemption for veterans in New York City. Throughout our history, we have been honored to have selfless men and women of our armed services put their lives on the line to serve our country in wartime. From the GI Bill of 1944 to New York City's successful efforts to place more than 2,300 veterans in jobs in the last three years, our government has, over the years, made efforts to repay that debt. Today, New York City is taking another step. One current property tax laws provide partial property tax exemptions to qualified veterans, but with an exclusion for school property tax that leaves our veterans with a bill that can reach up to $400 for a single family homeowner. Today, we close that loophole. At a time when we're surrounded by fear and uncertainty of what government may do, this bipartisan le legislation led by minority leader Steve and Matteo is a true reflection of our common values. Many thanks to minority leader Matteo for his leadership and perseverance on this important issue. And thank you to the speaker for her support of this during the budget negotiations. And Jimmy Vaca, um, this bill is a very small price to pay for the men and women who have risked their lives for us. And I urge all of you to support this today. Thank you. Seeing no one else on general orders, report of special committees? None. Report of standing committees? Report of the Committee on Civil Rights, intro 1259A, prohibiting discrimination on the basis of uniform service. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Education, intro 1347A, gifted and talented programs. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Environmental Protection, intro 1503B, air conditioning prohibitions. Amended and coupled on general orders. Preconsidered Reso 1561, environmental review for intro number 1503B. Coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Finance, Intro 1304B, Alternative Exemption for Veterans. Amended and coupled on general orders. Preconsidered Intro 1649, Maximum Exemptions Allowable for Veterans. Coupled on general orders. Preconsidered Reso 1563, Transparency Resolution. Coupled on general orders. LU 679 and Reso 1566 through LU 681 and Reso 1568 on page 4, Tax Exemptions. Give me one second. You, this one's a little confusing. Coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Fire and Criminal Justice Services, intro 1531A, 1541A, and 1561A, processing of bail payments. Amended and coupled on general orders. Intro 1576A, contact information for arrestees. Amended and coupled on general orders. Intro 1581A, Office of Criminal Justice and Posting Bail. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on General Welfare, Intro 929A and 932A, Health Services and Shelters. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Land Use, Intro 1219A, Reporting of Privately Owned Public Spaces. Amended and coupled on general orders. LU 651 and 652, Zoning Amendments. Approved with modifications and referred to the City Planning Commission pursuant to Rule 11.7DB <coughs> of the Rules of the Council and Section 197D of the New York City Charter. LU 653 and Reso 1569, Mulberry Street. Couple to be filed pursuant to letter of withdrawal. LU 654 and 655, zoning amendments. 
Approve with modifications and refer to the City Planning Commission pursuant to Rule 11.7DB of the Rules of the Council and Section 197D of the New York City Charter. LU 659 and Reso 1570 through LU 672 and Reso 1575 on the next page, tax exemptions. Coupled on general orders. LU 677 and Reso 1576 and LU 678 and Reso 1577 zoning amendments. Coupled on general orders. LU 685 and Reso 1578 through LU 688 and Reso 1581 special coastal risk district. Coupled on general orders. LU 693 and Reso 1582 property tax exemption. Coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Mental Health, Developmental Disability, Alcoholism, Substance Abuse and Disability Services intro 1225A behavioral health plan for the LGBTQ community. Amended and coupled on general orders. On the general order calendar, intro 709A, youth workforce program. Amended and coupled on general orders. Intro 1233A, exotic animal circus performances. Amended and coupled on general orders. LU 635 and Reso 1583 through LU 650 and Reso 1585. Coupled on general orders. Resolution appointing various persons, Commissioner of Deeds. Uh, coupled on general orders, and I ask for a roll call vote on all general orders. Quiet the chambers for a roll call. All items coupled on the general orders calendar. Baron. I vote aye on all with the exception of 1233A, on which I'm voting no. Borelli. Aye on all except 1531, 1541, 1561, 1576, 1581, and 1233A. Chin. Uh, permission to explain my vote? Yes. I just wanted to congratulate all my colleagues um, on their hard work on all their Important legislation, and especially to my sister, Councilmember Rosie Mendez, on Intro 1233A. She has worked so hard on it, and congratulations. I'm proud of OI on all. Thank you. Thank you. Constantinidis. Aye on all. Carnegie. Madam Public Advocate, permission to explain my vote, please? Yes, sir. So while I'm grateful in, uh, to the sponsor, Rosie Mendez, of today's bill, as well as to the speaker uh, for recognizing the concerns that many of us have raised uh, by, and, and the stakeholders regarding the implementation, implementation date and the concern for uh, the, implementation, the, the, imp, the implement, implementation date as it relates to um, the Universal Soul Circus. Uh, I look forward to supporting this bill as well as the upcoming amendment that we've discussed. I own all. Thank you. Drum. Commission to disclaim my vote. Yes, Council Member. Uh, again, I'd like to congratulate all the sponsors on today's legislation, especially Council Member Rosie Mendez on her great victory for animal rights. And also to uh, congratulate Council Member Torres on uh, his work on the uh, behavioral, uh, uh, the, the plan for behavioral needs of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and questioning persons. But to also mention that yesterday we held a hearing at which uh, the issue of conversion therapy was discussed and the health department came in totally unprepared. And I think that's really uh, evidence about why uh, Council Member uh, Torres's uh, legislation is so vitally important, and I certainly hope that in the end, when the health department comes through with this plan, that the issue of conversion th therapy is uh, is th totally addressed in that plan. Thank you very much, and I vote aye on all. Thank you. Espinel. I vote aye on all. Thank you. Eugene. I vote aye. Garodnik. Aye. Gibson. Permission to explain my vote? Yes. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate. And I, too, want to join our colleagues in congratulating everyone for passing legislation today, especially the uh, criminal justice bills that we're passing related to bail reform, Councilmember Richie Torres, and certainly Councilmember Rosie Mendez um, for her hard work on intro 1233. And I hear many of the concerns. I am a sponsor of the legislation. And certainly, I appreciate the efforts and the consideration for delaying the implementation. Uh, we know that with anything we do, 
do. There are always unintended consequences that are you know, unpreventable at times, but certainly representing many of those employees that are impacted by any work we do, particularly employees of color, um, it's always very concerning to allow individuals to be out of jobs, and, and that is very concerning for me. But I do understand the overall message and all of the work that's been put into Intro 1233, and that is why I am a sponsor and I do support it. And I want to thank Councilmember Mendez and all the advocates for their hard work. Um, nothing we do in this council is, is always about the bottom line and about common beliefs and common priorities. And I truly believe at the end of the day um, that it is passing for the right reason. So I look forward to the amendment next month. I look forward to delaying the implementation so that we can allow all those parties the proper amendments so their industries can be adjusted as well. So business either can maintain or can be changed. So with that, congratulations to all of my colleagues and I vote aye on all. Thank you. Thank you. Johnson. Uh, permission to explain my vote? Yes. I am pleased that the council is voting on the bill to prohibit exotic animals in, at circuses today. I fully support the amendment. We'll be passing next month to allow additional time for compliance. And with the rest of my time, I want to talk about something that's not uh, on the agenda that we're voting on today, and it is Gay Pride Month. Uh, I want to stand up. Council member. I want to do it during my time here because I can't stay for general discussion afterwards. So I'll be very, very quick. Okay. Um, I, I want to just say that I am a proud member of this council. I am a proud member of the LGBT caucus. I am openly HIV positive. I am uh, proud of this council for Richie Torres' bill today that we're passing, and I am proud of all the work that this council has done. And today, I want to remember New Yorkers that are sometimes forgotten. People like Marsha P. Johnson, who was at Stonewall, Sylvia Rivera, Bayard Rustin, who lived in Chelsea in my district and helped lead the march in Washington, Audrey Lord, Michael Callan, the living Larry Kramer, and many activists that came before me, came before many of us in this council, that laid the groundwork for us to actually be in elected office. Silence does equal death. We are not silent anymore. We are not silent in the wake of what happened last November, and then we are not silent about being ourselves and being proud of who we are. This council has seven openly LGBT members, and this council has been supportive, not just for the last three and a half years that I've been in office, but even before that. My predecessor, Christine Quinn, was an openly lesbian speaker of the council, and her predecessor, Tom Duane, was one of the first openly gay men ever elected in the state of New York. He was openly HIV positive at the height of the AIDS epidemic when people were dying. I stand on the, on the work that they built. I am here today because of them, and I am proud as an openly gay, openly HIV positive New Yorker. I look forward to marching down Fifth Avenue in solidarity with everyone this Sunday. Happy Pride Month. Thank you. Quiet in the chambers. Quiet in the chambers. This is how we support and condone our acceptance of the speeches. Thank you. Next, roll call. Kalos. Uh, permission to explain my vote? Yes. Uh, the best moment for me in 2013 was marrying my wife, who remains the best part of my life. I love you, Irene. Happy birthday. I vote aye and all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Shh. King. Um, I vote aye on all except for intro 1233. Bronx zoos, watch out, because here they come. Thank you. Kozlowitz. I vote aye. Thank you. I know all. Thank you. Lander. Aye on all. Thank you. Levin. Permission to explain my vote? Yes. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate. I just wanted to welcome, uh, they had left, but they were here earlier, the Hope Reichsback Fellows this year uh, visiting the City Council, Nyla Tolbert, Asamia Diaby, Hagir Elzin, Maria Jose Delgado, Kyla Maria Castro, and uh, Namire Tavares. And I just also want to welcome my interns, Adele Clemens, Michael Brittenham, and Cameron Crane. Thank you very much. I vote aye on all. Thank you. Maisel. I love you. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Mealy. I am. Thank you. 
Mendez. Aye, on all. Miller. Who is that? Congratulations to Council, my colleagues from Staten Island, Council Member Matteo on the passage of legislation on uh, veteran tax credit. It's long overdue. We're hoping that uh, homeowners can receive additional relief, but if we have to start somewhere, we want to start with the men and women who have served our communities and our country so admirably. I'll be voting aye on all except for 1233A. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Perkins. Aye on all, in including 1233A. Thank you. Richards. I vote aye uh, with the understanding that implementation will be delayed. So vote aye. Thank you. Rodriguez. Congratulations to my colleague Mendez, all the advocate group. Uh, you being a champion not only in this bill, but also on animal rights. And as a father of two daughters, I want to be sure that my daughter are born and been, have been born and raised, knowing that animals have feelings too. Uh, and thank you, the speaker, for also for helping to get a compromise. And with that, I vote aye. Thank you. Rose. Aye on all except 1233A. Rosenthal. At the risk of not being in Camp Mizell, permission to explain my vote. Yes, council member. <laughs> I vote aye on all. Uh, I do want to uh, give a particular shout out to council member Torres with his very smart and thoughtful legislation to require a plan to support our LGBT youth. Um, also to council member Matteo who, uh, you know, won't take no for an answer when it comes to vets and really, um, I apologize, really? Council Member. Did Quiet in the chambers, please. We're still in session. Job. Sorry, Council Member. Did a yeoman's job on this work and um, very impressive. Uh, Council Member Greenfeld, you, your legislation will answer the questions that my community board has been asking for the last 17 years. So thank you for that. Um, Council Member Constantinides, thank you for helping to keep the small businesses on the Upper West Side alive. And finally, with admiration to council members Barron and Mendez, I'm so proud to both sponsor and support intro 1233. Congratulations to all, in particular, uh, to John Phillips, who knows how to hang in there for an issue that matters. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cabrera. I on all, and I'd like to congratulate uh, Rosie Mendez for uh, your f uh, advocacy and leadership uh, on 1233, and John Phillips, well, you waited 11 years. That's a long time, uh, but today it has become a reality, and of course, to Ali, uh, and with that, I vote I on all. Thank you. Torres. Uh, permission to explain my vote? Yes. I, I will vote for 1223A. Um, I want to thank uh, the speaker and, I'm sorry, 1223? I'm sorry, I'm reading. I'm sorry, 1233? I, mis I, mis I miswrote the, the bill. Uh, I want to thank the speaker and uh, Councilmember Mendez for their openness to compromise. I know within the BLAC, opinion about the merits of the bill did vary. Some members were supportive on principle, some were against but there was broad agreement in favor of an amendment delaying the implementation to allow for an orderly transition, and I'm fully supportive of that compromise. So with that said, I vote aye on all. Thank you. Ulrich. Uh, Madam Public Advocate, I'd like to explain my vote. Yes, Enrico uh, Thank you. Ulrich. And uh, well, I have to learn <laughs> Spanish now, first of all. Um, yes, sir. You know, I played a pretty important role in the speaker's race, and I intend on playing a very important role on who heads the BLAC. So just I'm warning you, when that does happen, I will be the Sandra Day O'Connor of the uh, BLAC. Anyway, the swing vote there. Um, I first want to start by thanking the Land Use uh, Committee and the uh, Zoning Subcommittee, my, co my good colleagues and my friends, Donovan Richards and 
uh, David Greenfield for helping uh, me and my community get this resiliency zoning passed through the council, particularly for Broad Channel and Hamilton Beach, two areas which are still struggling to recover since Hurricane Sandy. And as those communities continue to rebuild, we want to make sure that they are rebuilding in the most resilient uh, fashion and that homeowners who, are, who have been there for many generations uh, can not only rebuild their lives and rebuild their homes, but also get finality from the buildings department and get a C of O for their property so that when they go to sell it or transfer it to a, uh, a family member, they don't encounter long-standing problems because they find that their homes are not in compliance with the zoning and businesses too, which have also been affected. I also want to commend uh, Steve Matteo, the minority leader, who has done a phenomenal, phenomenal job pushing this to the finish line uh, along with all the co-sponsors for the veterans' property tax exemption. This is real money that will make a real difference for veterans in our city, many of whom are living on fixed incomes and who desperately need to stay in the homes that they already have. If we want to talk about helping homeless veterans, well, that, that's good. And we should do everything that we can as a city to end veterans' homelessness, particularly chronic veteran homelessness. And I know that the administration has done a great job doing that. But we should also have a very coherent strategy for preventing more veterans from becoming homeless. And in doing so, making sure that veterans can stay in the homes or the apartments that they're already in, um, this is a big step in that direction. And five or six hundred dollars may not seem like a lot of money to some people, but for a veteran who is on disability or Social Security or receiving a small pension, this is going to make a difference. And I want to thank the public advocate as well. She's always been a strong champion for veterans. It's a bipartisan issue. It's the right thing to do. And I want to tip my hat to you, Steve. You did a great job. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Enrico Ulrich. Williams. <laughs> May I be excused for my vote? Yes, sir. Um, they left already, but I, I'm make sure I want to shout out my mother, Patricia Williams, and Dr. Sir Lawrence Joseph, who I just call Uncle Laurie, and thank them for coming. I um, want to shout out my colleagues for the uh, bills today, and um, particularly Councilmember Greenfield. He failed to, I don't know if he knew or mentioned the kind of troubles we had with POPs during Occupy Wall Street, uh, where they were closing and opening them at their will. They were taking signs off, but they didn't have signs posted, and I believe the work he's doing will go a great way for other types of uses uh, for POPs. Um, when it comes to 1233, this really wasn't a, a, a hard um, thought process for me. I do care about jobs uh, very much. Uh, I, when I was younger, uh, stopped eating meat because I didn't like the way they were killing animals. I'm now a pescatarian. I stopped going to circuses in my late teens, early 20s because of the way I learned uh, animals were being abused at those circuses. So this, to me, was just a continuation of what I've always believed. And so I fully support uh, 1233 and congratulate Councilman Mendoza on the work that uh, she's doing. And I appreciate her willingness uh, to make sure there weren't, uh, there was an easy transition uh, by supporting the amendments that we're going to make sure uh, this council comes on so there's an easy transition in the implementation stage, uh, in the implementation stage uh, so that people are not unduly hurt. Um, we can't just sit by and say that uh, animals can be hurt and that's just okay. And so I appreciate uh, her thoughtfulness and the discussion that appeared, uh, occurred in this body. Uh, with that, I'm proud to vote aye on all. Thank you. Council Member Ulrich. I'm sorry, I forgot to vote. I was talking so much anyway, but <laughs> I'm voting aye on all, proudly. Thank you. Yes on everything, thank you. Thank you. Matteo. Uh, I wanna thank my colleagues for their support. I opened up with it's a great day for veterans. I'll finish my remarks that it's a great day for veterans. Uh, in terms of voting, I'm voting no on 1531, 1541, 1561, 1576, 1581, and 1233A, I and the rest. Speaker Margaret Burrito. Thank you. I thank all of the advocates and all of those who were in the balcony. Thank you for following um, the instructions. I really appreciate it. Thank you for engaging in democracy as we await, await the vote.
again, we want to thank uh, the clerk and um, all of the staff for doing an amazing job. All items on today's general order calendar were adopted by a vote of 49 in the affirmative, zero negative, and zero abstentions, with the exception of intro 1541A, which was adopted by a vote of 46 in the affirmative, three negative, and zero abstentions, and intro 1531A, which was adopted by a vote of 47 in the affirmative, two negative, and zero abstentions, and intro 1561, which was adopted by a vote of 47 in the affirmative, two negative, and zero abstentions, and intro 1576A, which was adopted by a vote of 47 in the affirmative, two negative, and zero abstentions, and intro 1581A, which was adopted by a vote of 47 in the affirmative, two negative, and zero abstentions, and intro 1233A, which was adopted by a vote of 43 affirmative, six negative, and zero abstentions, and the revised, oh, I'm not finished. The revised land use call-up vote is 49 in the affirmative, zero in the negative, let it rip, go. We've not concluded. Sit down. Thank you. All right. And you got it out. Okay, now hold it. <laughs> Introduction and reading of bills. All items have been referred to a committee as indicated on the agenda. And now discussion of resolutions, beginning with this resolution sponsored by Councilmember Eugene, a resolution declaring June 22nd Veterans Tribute and Advocacy Day in New York City. Any mm -hmm. speakers? All of those in favor say aye. Aye. All of those opposed? Any abstentions? The ayes have it. And Resolution 1415A, sponsored by Councilmember Palma. Um, any speakers? An amended resolution calling upon the New York State Education Department to convene a task force to assess the cultural rel relevance of state learning standards across subject areas in elementary, middle, and high school and explore the grounding of standards in core content that, alleged, that challenges racism ableism and sexism and is LGBTQNTGNC affirming. All of those in favor say aye. Aye. All of those opposed? Any abstention? The ayes have it. And now to general discussion beginning with Council Member Espinal. All of those in the balcony, if you are exiting, please exit quietly and thank you for coming. I would just like to turn everyone's attention to intro 1652. Uh, it's the repeal of the ar uh, archaic cabaret law. Uh, the cabaret law, for you who don't know, it's a law that was introduced in the late 20s and used um, to go after uh, the Harlem jazz scene and uh, against the LGBT community um, night scene as well. It's, it's uh, homophobic and racist in, um, in its legacy and its history, and I, we, this law has no place in its books. Right now, it's used to regulate dancing across our city. And statistics have shown that, again, uh, establishments of color, establishments also patroned by the LGBTQ community, LGBTQ community uh, continue to be targeted. Uh, it's time that this law is taken off our books and that this city moves to the 20, 2017 and make sure that we're doing rights by all communities and make sure that dancing uh, is legal in the city of New York. I really want to give a shout out to the Dance Liberation Network and the New York City Artist Coalition for all of the work they've been doing on the ground uh, to bring light to this uh, bill. And again, I urge my colleagues to please sign on and let's get this archaic law off our books. Thank you. And let's dance. Council Member Barron. Uh, thank you, Madam Public Advocate. I want to call my colleagues' attention to Reso 1560, which relates to acknowledging the fundamental injustice, cruelty, brutality, and inhumanity of slavery Shh. in the city of New York and the state of New York and establish a commission to study reparations for African Americans and to recommend remedies. So I guess perhaps more people will check out their ancestry. We know that in 1991, there was construction of a federal building which unearthed the intact, the intact remains of 400 men, women, and children of African descent. We know that at least since 1625, uh, African Americans were here clearing the forests and woodlands. They built the wall that was at Wall Street. They built the roads. There were iron workers, craftsmen, blacksmiths. And we know that in New York State, in 1799, the Gradual Emancipation Act was enacted, which freed slave children born after that date 
but indentured them until they were adults. And we know that on the threshold of that widespread emancipation, the State Constitutional Convention of 1821 removed the property qualifications for ballot access for white men, but imposed a property qualification of $250 for blacks that effectively disenfranchised them. So we're asking that this commission be uh, formed and that they would consider whether any form of compensation to the descendants of African slaves is warranted and offer recommendations accordingly. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Rodriguez. I would, like to, I would like to thank my 28 colleagues at the council and the public advocate for being co-lead with the other new bill that we introduced today and that we will have a hearing tomorrow that is calling the DOT to install more pedestrian bowlers. You know, vehicle has become a weapon of mass destruction. We have seen it throughout Europe, especially in London. And that without the pedestrian bowlers in Times Square, dozens of people they could be killed. And with this bill, for which we will have a hearing tomorrow, we believe that we can save many lives. Also tomorrow, we are going to, going to be having a hearing about the black car uh, tipping uh, opportunity that will allow a uh, passenger to give uh, the tip to the drivers, especially in the black car in limousine. So tomorrow, we will have a press conference at 10 a.m. at the step and the hearing at 11 a.m. Thank you. Council Member Williams, who we now know is related to royalty. <laughs> Thank you very much. At first, I hope all the dads had a happy Father's Day. Uh, on that day, I'm reminded of <clears throat> my own dad, who I lost a few years ago, Dr. Gregory Williams. I miss him greatly, his prayerful and common spirit. Uh, I also, unfortunately, usually celebrate my mom on that day and others like her who uh, play a dual role as mom and dad in raising their children. I am deeply saddened and angered by the not guilty verdict for former Minnesota officer Geronimo Yanis and the shooting death of Philando Castile. I've seen a video where Mr. Castile informed him that he has a gun and the officer said, please don't pull it out. He said, I am not. The passenger said he's not and he was still shot. The lack of reverence uh, for black life has become all too commonplace in our country. This is not about revenge or looking for a harsh sentence. It's about looking for a fair one. Everyone deserves justice, no matter their background, their title. Every description of Mr. Castile is ph phenomenal. Uh, there's pictures of students with disabilities describing how they brought him to class and how we fed them. Uh, this man was shot to death and no one was held accountable. We see this story repeated over and over. You can just slip in the name and the title will remain the same. Uh, I also just want to say rest in peace. I am a hip hop fan. Uh, Albert Johnson, also known as Prodigy from Mob Deep, passed away yesterday for, uh, at the age of 42. He was quite open about his battles with sickle cell anemia. May they rest in peace. Council Member Rose. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I speak today um, in support of intro 1656, which will create an exemption for nonprofits from the tax lien sale. Most churches and small CBOs have limited staff and professional help. Filing exemptions is a complex process that, for example, has caught many of our houses of worship off guard. Even when an exemption is granted, the city's Department of Finance continues to seek unpaid taxes, frequently beyond the means of the organization. Those taxes are usually the basis for a tax lien. In fact, even the Archdiocese of New York, with all of its resources, has churches on the tax lien list and is struggling to clarify the situation. I hope that I can get other council members to support and co-sponsor this needed legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Council, and last, Council Member Eugene. Thank you very much, Madam uh, Public Advocate. I just want to thank uh, my colleagues for voting on Resolution 1412. And I want to thank also the chair of the Veterans Committee, my colleague, Eric R. R. Rich. But the result, I want to say that the resolution 1412 proposes that the veteran tribute and advocacy day be held on the anniversary of the day that the President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed the GI Bill of Right and into law, creating a modern system of benefit for veterans. My intention with a veteran tribute and advocacy day 
is not only to celebrate the service and sacrifices of our veterans, but uh, to take this day as an opportunity to advocate for better resources for veterans while returning uh, to civilian life. Veterans of all ages face a wide range of challenges, health problems, mental health uh, uh, problems, difficulties uh, readjusting uh, to family and civilian life, and more. And I think it is right to take the anniversary of the GI Bill to advocate for better services and resources for those who, gave, who have given so much to serve our country. I, would, I want to thank all my colleagues, and I want to also thank the, the speaker for her leadership. We owe to our veterans a great deal of our recognition and gratitude. Thank you very much, Madam Public Advocate. Thank you, and to close the speaker, Melissa Mockley-Burrito. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate, to my colleagues as well, and we are adjourned. <laughs>